All right. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you guys here today. I invite you to come on in and find a seat as we enter into a time of worship this morning. If you're joining us online today, we're so thankful that you're here. My name is Adam Looney, and I'm one of the ministers here, and it is a joy to share in this time with you. All right. So if you're in the room, I invite you to stand. You can stand at home, too, if you'd like, but... uh, Let's enter into a time of praise together. <coughs> to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. spoke it to be. You were the King of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. So I could praise your great and matchless name All my days, all my days So let my whole life be a blazing offering A life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever All for you and for your glory, take my life and let it be yours. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory take my life and let it be yours take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory take my life and let it be yours let it be yours amen please be seated hello everyone and welcome to greenville oaks 
Whether joining us online or gathering here in person, we're grateful for your presence and hope you have a meaningful experience with us. Later on in our gathering, we'll share communion together. So if you haven't done so already, please pick up your communion kit at one of the tables around the worship center. On the screen and on the seat back in front of you, you'll find a QR code you can scan with your phone. This will take you to a page with several communication options. If this is your first time with us, please click on the I'm new button and share your contact information with us so we can provide you with more information about Greenville Oaks. If you're a member or regular attender, please click on the check in button and let us know you're here or that you're watching from home. There's also a button for requesting prayer. We also have an on-site prayer room in the West Foyer where you can go and pray with one of our shepherd couples at any point during the gathering. Finally, you'll notice a button for online giving. If you prefer this option over putting your offering in the collection boxes stationed around the room. And if QR codes aren't your thing, you can fill out the appropriate communication card from the slot in the seat back in front of you and put it in the offering box as well. One of our values here at Greenville Oaks is demonstrate selflessness. We learn how to do this from Jesus who laid down his life for us. We hope you leave this gathering grateful for Jesus's sacrificial love and inspired to follow his example by serving others. Good morning, everyone. My name is, good morning. <laughs> My name is Wes Rasby. I'm one of the ministers here. And we're so excited that you're with us this morning, whether you are uh, tuning in at home or wherever you are, or if you're in the room, we're excited that you're here. And especially if you're new with us, uh, we're so excited that you're here with us this morning. I uh, want to make you aware of a couple things, and then we'll continue on in our praise and worship uh, together this morning. First of all, uh, as you heard in the video, one of our values here is to demonstrate selflessness, and we have an opportunity to do that today. Today is the very last Sunday for collections for the Super Bowl of Caring. Our fourth and fifth grade class, our fourth and fifth grade kids here at this church set a goal for 2006 cans or non-perishable food items. And as of this past week, they only were halfway there. So I'd invite you to, uh, to, to bring anything that you have, whether you're at home, you can run it by the church, or if you're in first service, you can go home and get it and run it back by the church and drop it off. Uh, we'd love to exceed their goal for them uh, and also demonstrate selflessness uh, in our own lives as well. Also, today, Wade is not with us, uh, but we'll get to hear from a very special guest preacher this morning. Uh, Dan Bouchel will be with us today. He is the president at the uh, Mission Resource Network. Uh, he's been here a handful of times, so he may look familiar to you, but <clears throat> I'm excited to hear what God has been preparing in Dan uh, as he's been preparing for this day and, and how God will speak through him to us today. Uh, and last but not least... Um, we, like I said, we'll continue on in our praise and worship. And I'm gonna let this next video transition us into that because what better way to celebrate transformation? What better way to celebrate and, and thank the, the Lord for what he's doing and what he's done in people's lives than to celebrate the new life that people have found because of our savior, Jesus. Let's watch this video together. Um, I'm so honored that Jane asked me to do this. And I'm just so beyond proud of her. Do you believe that he died on the cross and rose three days later for the forgiveness of your sins? Yes. Upon that proclamation, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Haley wants to give her life to Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. You have been on this journey all of your life to know Jesus and you've come to this moment of giving your life to him and it's all, it, as far as our, our, our moment of baptism it comes down to this question do you believe Jesus Christ is the son of God Absolutely. do you believe that he died and rose from the grave so that all your sins can be forgiven alright Haley because of your confession that Jesus Christ is the son of God I baptize you now in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's take a deep breath and think about all that stuff that has happened in your life that may have separated you from God. It's going to be washed away right now. 
You're going to come up out of this water, a new creation. The old Shauna is gone. The new Shauna will raise up out of the water. Amen. Shauna, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Are you going to make him the Lord of your life even more so than you have now? All right? Yeah, because of that confession, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of all your sins. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe that He's the Son of God? Yes, I do. And do you believe He died for your sins? Yes, I do. And rose to give you new life? Yes, I do. All right, my brother. Come on, that, that'll work too. <laughs> and because of your faith in Jesus Christ, Justin, it is my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. There you go. Oh, man. Oh, man. Amen. Boy, isn't that great? No better way to continue in our worship than after seeing that and seeing what God is doing in people's lives and celebrating his love for us. Let's stand together. Let's sing, Good, Good Father. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased in that. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, 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 you're a good, good father.
It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Ladies, let's sing this together in unison. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Altos, join us. Randy Baker. I do love that song. That is beautiful. In just a moment, we're going to share together 
in the supper of our Lord. And as was said earlier, if you didn't pick up the emblems on your way in, they are available in the back and on the sides. I encourage you to, to do that at this time, to grab those. The bread and the cup. The bread that represents the body of our Lord. And the cup, the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. Flesh and blood. I don't know if you've thought about it, but that term is used quite a bit throughout the, the scriptures. In the Old Testament, flesh and blood talks about a family relationship. One's ancestors or one's offsprings are one's flesh and blood. In the New Testament, a different use altogether where it distinguishes physical man or humanity from spiritual. You and I are flesh and blood. Jesus came in flesh and blood. In John chapter 6, Jesus uses a, a different use for this term altogether. He uses a spiritual uh, use for this term. He had just fed 5,000 people. And the very next day, a crowd was pursuing Jesus. And they wanted to not see another miracle. But as Jesus noted, noted they wanted to be fed. They even said... Our fathers had manna in the wilderness. And listen to what Jesus says to them. He says, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you true, the true bread from heaven. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He goes on to say that whoever feeds upon his flesh and blood would live forever. I mean, that was a very difficult message for the hearers of that day, and sadly, they didn't understand what he was, what he was saying. They misunderstood completely. In fact, they were offended the spiritual metaphor was missed altogether. Today, as we take this cup and break this bread that represent the body and blood of Jesus, the flesh and blood of our Savior, be reminded that Jesus himself is our spiritual nourishment, the true bread of life that has come from heaven that we might have life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your one and only Son that you sent to this world in flesh and blood to walk among men that we might have a chance to feed on the true bread of life, the life of Jesus that was broken, that was given for us, that we might live as we take this cup and break this bread May we be reminded of that loving sacrifice. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a 
friends, three years old through fifth grade, you guys can be dismissed to children's worship right out this back door over here. Lots of awesome children's ministry volunteers will be there to meet you and greet you and lead you down the hall. If you're a guest with us today, you'd like for your kiddos to be a part of uh, uh, our great children's worship. Just follow the crowd out the door and uh, some volunteers will help you find your way. All right, as they're being dismissed, let's stand. Let's sing one more song. Who you say I am. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Sunset free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. 
Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, Greenville Oaks. It's good to be back with you. It's been a little while, and I'm so grateful to Wade and uh, to the leaders of this church for the opportunity to be with you, and we are so particularly grateful for your partnership with us in the Mediterranean Rim Initiative, uh, particularly in North Africa. And when I come, that's usually what I talk about, but Wade actually wanted me to come in and kind of speak into something that fit within this series he's been doing in Mark. So let me start by telling you something about myself. I hate Scrabble. I mean, I hate Scrabble. I I hate all word games because I'm highly competitive and I'm dyslexic. (laughs) Which reminds me of the story of the agnostic dyslexic insomniac. He laid awake all night wondering if there really was a dog. (laughs) Well, stupid as that may be, that's kind of the way my mind dysfunctions. I I see words when I'm proofreading my own writing. I see words that aren't there. I invert numbers and letters. I can't spell cat if you spot me the C and the A. And one of the things that's very embarrassing to me, and it happens all of the time, I'll go back and read an email that I sent, or I'll see one that somebody's responded to, and I'll realize what a disaster I made of that email. If you read an email from me, you'll probably think that my English teacher was Tarzan. That's just the way my brain misfunctions. And as a result, word games are a torture to me. Fortunately, my wife loves them. And she boggles my mind about that. Uh, And so we just learned we don't play those. So she plays those with her, her family. There's this thing called Wordle. I cannot imagine anything more torturous than to, to, why why would you do that to yourself? And because of the fact that I have this mental challenge, um, I don't play word games because I hate feeling like a failure. I don't like to be embarrassed. I don't like to be reminded of how weak I am. Now, I say all that to say this. I think that's how most people feel when they read Jesus' teachings. I really do. I think that's one of the reasons why we struggle with the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Scholars through the ages, even Martin Luther, had basically said, this is impossible to do. And the only reason that Jesus gave this teaching was to drive us to grace. Because once we see the impossibility of doing Jesus' teachings, all we can do is just turn to God in grace. And I understand that reaction. I just think that that's a mistake. I actually think Jesus gave us this teaching because he thought it would give us life. And that it was something that we could live into, if not perfectly, well. But to so many people, the idea of trying to be like Jesus is such a ridiculously impossible task that it's not worth attempting. It's like saying, next year I'm going to train to swim the Pacific Ocean. It's like, well, good luck with that, you know. Uh, I'd be surprised if you get to Catalina Island. Um, I I really think that's how we view the teachings of Jesus at a gut level. The biggest challenge I think we have in the church is simply this. We don't believe that Jesus knew how to live very well. Now, that may sound crazy to you, but I, I really do believe that. I think that we believe that Jesus knew how to die well and how to come back from the dead, but we're not so convinced that he knew how to live his life well. 
that Jesus was sweet and he was good and he was idealistic, but he was impractical and he was out of touch with the daily realities that we deal with every single time. Jesus' teachings are great to aspire to, but they're not useful in the real world. We would love to obey the teachings of Jesus, but unfortunately, we have to live in a world where that doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, then we have King's X. We don't have to attempt it. And what that means, to steal more from Dallas Willard, is we become spiritual vampires. We want Jesus for his blood, and that's all. So how do we avoid turning the teachings of Jesus into an impossible legalism that only drives us to despair? How do we use the teachings of Jesus in a way that actually is life-producing? And I want to suggest to you that, this, that the answer to that question is, is in learning to imitate the life of Jesus. We can't keep the teachings of Jesus on willpower. We have to imitate the life of Jesus to obey the teachings of Jesus. Because spiritual growth is not about learning how to swim, it's about learning how to float. It is not about tightening our grip, it is about letting go and surrendering in the flow of the Spirit of God as we learn to trust that Jesus not only was nice and sweet, but actually smart. And when we think of Jesus as a teacher, I think we instinctively go to the words of Jesus. If you're in a red letter edition of the Bible, then you go to the, the red letters, the teachings of Jesus, which I absolutely adore. And, and we think of the Sermon on the Mount, for example, or the parables or the many sayings of Jesus, and that makes sense, and we do need to focus here. And we should read them often, and we should memorize them, and as, as good as it is to read Paul and Peter and James and the others, that's wonderful, that's insightful, but they're not Jesus. Jesus is our primary teacher. Jesus said to us in John 6, the words that I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. And Peter responded to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so don't hear me diminishing the words of Jesus. Jesus' teachings are still his primary way to inform us. And, and Jesus' most powerful teaching was not just, however, his spoken words, but Jesus' most powerful teaching, which I think surpassed even his words, are his life. In John chapter 1, we have that extended opening to the gospel, the prologue, which is a meditation on the word, word. And we are told that God, when he really wanted to speak a word to us, came in the flesh, in the form of Jesus. When God wanted to speak most clearly to us, he didn't send a book, he sent a son. He did not send us a map, he sent us a guide. Now, which one would you rather have to go through a difficult passage? A map or a guide? The word of God is not just the Bible. The word of God is a person, Jesus Christ. And the foundational life question we all need to be wrestling with is who is my life model? Who is my mentor? Who sets my pattern, my model for life? It's not just somebody whose works you've read, it's somebody that you have walked the world with. Someone that you have not only heard, but someone that you have imitated. Because we repeat our primary models, practices. And that works both for us and against us. It depends on whether your models are good models or bad models. Did you know that most people who are child abusers are themselves the victim of child abuse? They almost all, if not all, swore they would never do this to others. But when pressures come, they only have one model for how to deal with them. And they live out the model they have seen, not what they intend. Addiction runs in families, not just because genetic predisposition, but because this is the model that was practiced for how to deal with stress and struggle in the world. We live out our models, so choosing our models is very important. Christians are called to be apprentices of a master craftsman. That's what a disciple is, an apprentice of a master craftsman. But our master craftsman is specifically skilled in living well. 
And Jesus calls us not to just do what he said, but to do what he did. I think that's why we have four Gospels and only one book of Romans. We have four stories filled with Jesus' model. Here's how Jesus behaves. Here's what Jesus does. Do this. Jesus himself said in John 5, 39 and 40, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in him you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Our life isn't found in a book. It's found in a relationship with a person. And if we're going to be disciples who make disciples, then we have to pay as much attention to what Jesus did as what he said because his model and his habits matter a great deal. Now, this came home to me very powerfully years ago when I was preparing a sermon series on the book of Mark, which I think Wade is in with you now. And one of the things that struck me when I studied the book of Mark is that Mark, more than any other of the gospel writers, refers to Jesus as rabbi or teacher. More times per chapter than any other gospel writers, he calls Jesus rabbi, calls Jesus teacher. But he doesn't actually provide many of Jesus' teachings. Mark doesn't have the long extended teaching passages like the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. We don't have multiple chapters worth of teaching very often like we do in Matthew who gives us five such long teaching passages. Both Luke and John have lengthy uh, sections, chapters that are just the teachings of Jesus. But Mark only has one chapter as we divide it that's totally devoted to teachings and that's John, I mean Mark chapter four. Most of Christ's teachings in Mark are very brief comments at the end of a story to kind of explain or cap what Jesus just did, to explain his behavior. And yet, more than any of the other gospel writers, Mark says Jesus is our teacher. He's our teacher. Now, why call him our teacher so much and not give us many words? Because I think the answer is that Mark is saying Jesus' life is our teacher. Jesus' life is our teacher. And Mark shows us how Jesus lived, not just what he said. And that means if we want the abundant light that Christ offers, we have to imitate his life, not just read his words. We cannot keep Jesus' teachings if we don't imitate Jesus' habits. We obviously cannot in, in, imitate all of his habits. We, we can't all quit our jobs and never marry and wear tunics and sandals and heal the sick and drive out demons and pick fights with church leaders all the time, although that last one we do fairly well. But beyond some details peculiar to Jesus' time and unique role, there is a rhythm and a logic to Jesus' life that we need to imitate. There's a rhythm and a logic to Jesus' life we need to imitate. And, and the church is, or at least it should be, a community of people who are mentoring each other to move into the life of Jesus. And that means moving from information to formation by providing us with models of imitation. Galen Van Rienen said this so very well, that it's very, very difficult for people to move from information to formation directly. We have, for over 100 years in this country, and most of the Western world, and, and extended beyond that for a shorter length of time, tried to transform the world through education. We believe, deep in our bones, that information should lead to transformation, even though we have virtually no evidence that that works. Between information and transformation, there's this middle passage that is so very important called imitation. Imitation. Information plus imitation can lead to transformation. But sadly, our churches are built like schools with lots and lots of events designed to give education, but almost no structures and practices for imitation. And for this to change, we're going to have to build modeling relationships into our life. And if our churches won't do it for us, we have to seek it out on our own. Now, this used to happen probably more when we had an informal, more extended family, more clannish kind of existence as human beings, but in the modern world of disconnected individualism and technology, we just don't have many life models. And without living models to show us what Christ -like looks like when it gets up, puts on its pants, and goes out into the world, then we're going to struggle to walk like Jesus. The church is supposed to be Jesus' body continuing the story of Jesus. I love Acts chapter 1, verse 1. 
Uh, Luke starts by saying, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That word began is very important because Acts is the story of what Jesus continues to do and teach. He does it in his first body in Luke, a physical body. He does it in his second body, the church, who continue the doings and the teachings of Jesus in the world. Our mission in the church is not the formation of churches, it's the formation of people. And we are committed in the West to creating institutions in the assumption institutions will disciple people, but we haven't really asked the question, what are the disciples, how are they made, and how, are we, how can we structure to do that? And we're never going to get where we're going with the model that we have embraced in most churches. And if the church doesn't practice the rhythms of Christ's life, we'll end up with little of his power, and the church will just become one more time-consuming institution leading to greater exhaustion. And it will not be that light and easy yoke that gives us rest. Now, the rhythm of Jesus' life, the rhythm of Jesus' life goes from the desert to the marketplace, from the desert to the to the marketplace. And I think this is the secret that we miss. Jesus' private habits made his public life possible. There's this weird thing that happens in the life of Jesus. You, you have various ways of kind of setting the stage, the story of how Jesus enters the world, but once Jesus burst onto the scene and he is anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism and God declares from heaven, either this is my son or you are my son, depending on which one of the gospels you're reading, and you have this climactic moment and we expect him to start doing something. Instead, what does he do? He disappears stage left. And he goes off into the wilderness for over a month, which is plenty of time for him to fall out of the public consciousness. His first act after being commissioned by the Father for ministry is to go off by himself. That's a really odd way to launch your new ministry. Jesus had no public life or ministry before he went into the desert. And in the desert, he set the direction for his ministry and the character for his ministry. In the desert, Jesus practiced the classical spiritual disciplines of solitude and silence and fasting, meditation and prayer and memorization of recitement of scripture. That is how the rhythm of the life of Jesus begins, in the desert. And that was not a one-time event. It was a regular part of his life rhythm. And if you look for it in the gospels, you see it everywhere. After his first big day of ministry... In Mark chapter 1, during all of the hubbub and all of the healing and all of the excitement and all of the crowds, Jesus gets up early in Mark 1 and goes off by himself to be alone with God. After a big day of healing in Luke chapter 4, it's created all kinds of attention. Luke 4, 42, Jesus goes off by himself to be alone with God. After the feeding of the 5,000, which is such an important story, all of the Gospels tell it. After the feeding of the 5,000, when they're ready to make him king, when, when the, the crowds are coming and, and they're, they're all, this, let's capitalize on this excitement, Jesus dismisses the crowds. He puts all the disciples on a boat to leave him alone, and he goes off by himself to pray. This is the pattern and the secret of Jesus' life. The power of Jesus' ministry came in his private times with the Father, we see the spirit-empowered miracles, but we forget the private time. Jesus explained this in Matthew 6, verses 5 and 6, when he says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, what is that reward? Probably not a new Learjet. Probably not even heaven. I think the reward is the life of God. The spirit of God, the empowering of God, the presence of God. Now, this wasn't new with Jesus. He just perfected it. Look at the life of Moses. Look at the life of Elijah. Look at the life of David. 
What do those men's lives have in common? Extended desert or wilderness experiences. When we meet God in solitude, silence, prayer, and meditation, we create space for God's spirit to come in and bear fruit. So many of us are like cell phones that have never been put on the charger. They just lie there dead. So many of us are like sponges who are so dry we can't be used to clean anything because we never soak in the solution of the Spirit of God. If we don't intentionally meet God in the desert and we go into the marketplace alone, then we're going to experience defeat or sinful pride. We'll either become like the sinners or like the Pharisees, but we will not become like Jesus. And too many Christians simply have no desert experience. We just never build alone and quiet with God into our lives. This is not complicated, people. We just want to be around people and noise all the time. We go, 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 go. And no wonder we're tired and frazzled and irritable and susceptible to all kinds of misbehavior. And while it's important to retreat with our Christian family, that's not the same thing as being alone with God. In silence, to pray and meditate and listen to him. You want to hear God speak? You're going to have to get quiet for a good long while. He's a little shy. He's a gentleman. He will not interrupt you. Now, you need guides for your desert work. You need mentors. You need a community. That's where the church comes in. You may go to the desert alone, but you can't understand what happens in the desert by yourself. And you can't benefit it alone. You need a discipleship group that helps you unpack and make sense of your desert experience. But they can't do it for you. And when we talk about spiritual practices, this is what we're talking about. Practicing the presence of God. To play like a champion, you have to practice like a champion. There was once a virtuoso violinist who played an extended concert and just thrilled everybody. And one young man came up after him and said, I would, I would give everything I have to play like that. And the violinist said, I did. The life of Jesus tells us that if we want to be like Jesus in the marketplace, society, we must make room for God's spirit to work in the desert of solitude. And too often we want church and worship services like this to be our desert. We want to connect with God in public. And I'm just here to tell you that's never going to be adequate. If we don't worship God alone, we will not worship much when we're together. Public worship has little power to change those who don't seek God alone. Public worship is an appetizer for the meal, but the best meals are taken in the company of God alone. And if we seek God daily alone, then our gatherings can become powerful moments of celebration and transformation because we come full and ready to give to others from the depths of what God has been doing in us and we can share out of the things that God has been speaking to us and we can enrich and encourage each other because we each have a gift to give and so we can give and receive. But if you expect too much from public worship, you will crush it with your need. If you consistently come empty because you haven't spent time with God in the desert, you're going to leave disappointed and critical. I really do believe that most of the worship wars that we had in the 90s and the early 2000s and even in today were driven by the fact that we made worship just too important because it was the only meal we were going to get all week long and we came starving and we left still undernourished. We just ask too much from our public worship because it's the only place we go. Church gatherings can give us courage and motivation to enter the desert and help us interpret the desert, but they are not the desert. And so if weekly gatherings are all, our, all we have, we will barely live or starve to death Church gatherings like this make a great halftime, but it's not the game. We aren't called to build big churches, but rather faithful followers of our master. 
And that takes making the ways of Jesus as important as the words of Jesus. Now, I have good news for you. Jesus is desperately looking for people he can trust with his power and his life. He wants to give this to you. But it won't happen by trying harder to be good. That only leads to failure. It happens by learning to trust and practice the rhythm of the life of Jesus, modeled and taught by his life pattern. Because in the desert where you can do nothing and you realize you are nothing without him, you learn to surrender so that when you leave, you have his power working through you to actually do something meaningful in the world. So are you ready for more life? Well, try imitating the rhythm of Jesus from the desert to the marketplace, from the desert to the marketplace. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we do want more than the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for paying for our sins. Thank you for embracing death that we might have life. But Lord, we don't just want you for your blood. We want the life, the life that we see in Jesus. Please, Lord, give us your life. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for that. It's a privilege to have you here to share that with us this morning. All right, let's stand. Let's sing one more song together, and then we'll be dismissed. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a Flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna see in the middle of the storm. Hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. Amen, amen. Go and have a blessed week. God bless.